we will have one demo I think Michael do you show that today yes good and can someone I could it could be me but I didn't pull the branch um, I would love to see a demo from the multicolon rows widget editor well flow editor so this contributor this country okay let's open that first and what's the name of the contributor I think we merged one of his PR so we'll find it there's a new contributor that so let's open that just to see why I'm talking about it. Uh, where is he? No, no, no. I am too old. I need to pull. NS8482E, but they have a name. I think that's this one. Arcadius Pochik. That's him, right? I think that's the user. That's not the user. Okay. So okay, so that's Oh yeah, yeah, this So there are two dif different ones that work on widgets apparently or is this one you're working on widgets trying to fix everything and the other one just there are two very good two of them are very good so yeah I think we should try and demo the module that he made um, so we could see if we can merge that because it looks really nice people have been asking for more um, WYSIWYG editors forms and widgets there is Niraj, but there is also Arcadius. They work on widgets and forms. Yeah, forms and widgets. Yeah, 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 forms and widgets. But this one made the flows editor. So yeah, two very good contributors, recent ones at least. Um, so I'd love to see that. So going back on the updates on Orchard One, we did triage and there was nothing. And there is still nothing. So going back on Orchard Core. We're seeing going back on Orchard Core here. What? have we done in the last seven days probably too much I'm sure too much too much because we shipped and too much because we should not do as much before we ship but but that's how we do things so optimization the resource manager maybe we talked about it resource manager dependency resolution we talked about it um, <clears throat> Updating default logging settings, like we talked about it also. Um, default paging to GraphQL queries, we talked about it. Update ASP.NET dependencies to 3 or C1. So we so Antoine made the change to use the newer SDK at that time, RC1. Um, mm, 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 this is a branch I made between merge to rescue lang version properties no more necessary actually it is unless you use Visual Studio 2019 which you need if you want to do um, the .NET Core 3 development which you need if you want to use Orchard Core now so we removed it um, well Shanti already did then here page endpoint priority from Chantieri fixing some issues with page endpoints I found a bug this morning I, I'm not sure I can repro I talked to him 
about it, I found an issue with page endpoints. Um, and I could repro it if I use the packaged module, and then I could not repro it anymore with the package module. So we'll see during my .NET Conf talk if I can repro it or not. That would be a surprise. I don't know if I should try it, but I will. We'll see. Um, regression fix content field picker, add alert if no recipe is found on search results. So Hisham has been adding alerts warnings when search results don't return anything. At least to know that it's not a bug, it's just it could not find anything. It's not just a blank page. Um, same thing everywhere. Optimizing the admin pages. And then, so um, Hisham was improving the, the toolbars, mostly the one that Antoine made because it was not nice. And then something happened. Um, and then Antoine made a thing. He listened to Jasma <laughs> and made the toolbar look like GitHub. And it's beautiful. It's a PR. And then Isham was like, uh, why didn't you do that before I do all my changes? <laughs> but that's good. So Jasma talks, Antoine listens, and Isham complains. It's a good team. I like it. Um, so yeah, I assume the next step is to do things this way it looks very nice and much more concise uh, than repeating all the things all the, all the time looks nice good job we'll see how it goes and i don't want to take it for rc because it's changing the content items page too much risk like we miss a filter or a search or a button doesn't work and it's done so yeah it kind of wait for one zero and that's beautiful uh, it's not a line here. I don't know if there is, if it's on purpose or if there is something to do or if it's just how it works. I don't know, but it doesn't look like it's this bulk action and this item here is not aligned. Maybe this one is a weird place. The rest seems to be super aligned. I don't know. Just a small comment, but that's very nice. Um, and then once we do that for content items, we can apply it everywhere. Okay, um, so prefy things, fix configured feature shell script manager registration, trust Chantiri for that, <laughs> string builder best, best practices, so Antoine made some perf improvements, or yeah, perf improvements indirectly, but following how we should use a string builder, or when not to use a string builder. Add translation meta package to CMS targets. Um, so this is great. Add translation meta package CMS targets. So we have as expected we added the orchard core dot translations dot all to the CMS target. If you use the CMS dot core target you won't have it but if you use a CMS target you get the themes and all the localization in your um, solution already. But it didn't work until Jean Thierry actually fix the support for that. It was missing some MS build targets, so it changed then the translation the translations repository to support it correctly. But it it works beautifully. Now you just add a supported culture, you make it a default or you select it through your browser or your the URL and you will get the correct localization on the admin. Super nice, super neat. Love it. I want to be able to show it on tryorchardproject.net once it's pushed there. Um, Dean remove workflow menu and remove the image. So Dean has been cleaning up some things recently. Removing dependencies on net standard library. So now we don't need them anymore. It works. Uh, and to do that, I had 
to remove the direct reference to the EF core um, data store for OpenID. So we still have OpenID, but I removed by default the entity framework core module. So otherwise, it will reference Netzener library and pick up a lot of other dependencies with it. So I removed the reference. I kept, kept the module. You can still reference it, but to do self-contained deployment, uh, it's better this way. Um, until we update to the new NT framework, which won't have this issue anymore. But to do that, we need a new version of OpenID. That's why I removed it so far, just from the references, not from the solution. Fixing Orchid Core localization dependencies. Yeah, because we were um, incorrectly referencing Orchid Core from the localization package, which I don't want to. The localization package is not a module. It's just a set of services to localize and pluralize ASP.NET application. It should not depend on the Orchard Core framework itself. It's part of it, but this way any ASP.NET app can use it. Regression fix bootstrap confirm model. Mobile size. Okay. A bootstrap confirm model fix. Format dependent features in disabled dialog. So now it's nicer. If you disable features, it won't be a flat list. It will be a bullet point list. Introducing full text aspect. Whoa! Let's do a demo. Um, I We didn't implement it. Aspect. Fully. Um, so sad. We need to do something else. But security critical permissions. Yes, this one is nice also. Can show it. The idea is that now for all the permissions, actually, I haven't tried it. For all the permissions that could be elevated, um, well, that could be used to elevate the current user's permission, then there is a warning to say, hey, if you give the permission to execute the workflow, then it's just UI permission because, because it's like adding admin potentially permission. Because with a workflow execution, you can do whatever you want. Same thing with being able to manage roles. If you give the managed role to a role, this role can enhance itself to an admin role, to a greater role. Register content parts and fields in content options, also good refactoring. Um, so the idea is that we don't inject a content part in the DI directly. We add the type of the content part to an option, which is I option content options, so that you, we don't have to resolve content part to get instances of content parts to know what are the content parts that are available. We can just get the option and get a list of types and later we'll be able to add metadata. Um, and we do the same things for fields. Being able to add metadata will allow us to categorize parts and fields. For instance, a Bertrand is using it to make a front front end fields. So by adding metadata he could just filter the fields that are available for for his modules or for the front end and display them in list and not the other ones. Or same thing for us. The same way we have a stereotype or content type and it allows us internally by knowing which kinds of content types uh, we expect to filter them and use them differently. Upgrade fluid with fixes and performance improvements from Marco. Uh, import model state I page filter implementation for forms module. There was an issue with the form validation in Razor pages. Fix console login messages because we were not uh, displaying the, the logs correctly in the console at different levels, so it's fixed. Fix six, fixing uh, the reference exception, uh, list items, routes. 
here route content type ID fixes an issue with a number from Niraj, a widget rendering, adding links to video for decouple and headless, so links directly to the parts of the YouTube video um, that talks about these things in documentation, handle standard startup class, beautiful, finally, startup class. Um, super risky to merge it on Sunday, but we did it. I will show you. Support for validation error class from yeah, on widgets, on forms, which are based on widgets. Fixed mini profiler by using the version that works with Netcore 3.0. Content item tag helper and liquid tag, mostly documentation, but we have a content type, content item tag helper and um, liquid tag. So we can render a content item directly and use caching instead of passing through a shape. We still need to use the menu shape because it has custom alternates um, that are specific to, specific to it. So we can't remove it, but at least now we have a content item that will also do it for anything. Um, modify UTC and publish UTC should take into account when recipe runs. Um, it's just that when we import a content item, if the modified or published UTC values are set, they will have to override whatever the handlers say. A mess build target to copy translation files, I talked about it earlier. Update to Netcore 3.0 uh, yesterday. <coughs> so we are using Netcore 3.0. This was the plan and it went well. Then all the last minute fixes and features, super risky, loading all PO files from localization folder because I was testing that and uh, why is that text not localized? It's because it was in a file that was not related to a module and we were just loading a PO files for module names in this folder. So now we are loading everything and now it works beautifully. Um, fall back to detail display type for back parts and I don't agree with the PR that Dean created based on some comments I made because the comments is actually wrong. When I fix that, so the idea is that if you create a back part and in the settings you remove the display type of the content types you want in the back part, then it will be null here. Then it will fall back to summary. But because there are widgets, if you didn't implement the summary view of the widget you are rendering, it will fall back to widget underscore underscore summary um, template. But this thing doesn't exist, so it will fail with the shape not found. So the solution is to actually fall back to the detail, which is the default um, display type that we use for widgets when we render them. And then there will be a fallback. Even if you didn't implement a detailed view for your custom widget, it will fall back to the default widget template. Um, and I think Dean made a PR to also create the summary one. But I don't think we should do that because we never do that. And and you can type anything in this, check, in this text box. So if you type summary, then you should have a summary alternate for the widgets you want to render in the back part. If you type foo, then you should have a foo display type for your widgets. And if you type nothing, we'll use detail. So I don't think we should add summary unless there is the reason. Yep, so it's very specific. So if you remove something or if you type something, well, you should expect that what you type should exist or there will be an exception and then you will fix it. But we should default to detail because that's what widgets do. Um, we, uh, meaning, we could do that but we don't need to do more than what's already there now. Fix razor options when the refs, um, auto translation all beta to all RC1. So we pushed all the translations to NuGet and then we referenced the ones from NuGet. Uh, near agile fixing more widget issues, styling issues. Chantry removing dependency we are not using. Chantry doing some stuff because I 
I um, challenged him <laughs> and I won't even use it I think I don't have time to do that will I have will I have time I don't think I have time it was for my uh, .NET Conf talk I was like let's do a demo where we have two modules that contain each of them a layout and then each tenant can have a different layout but I won't show it I won't have the time to do that I think um, update Orchard Core to RC1 as expected update version prefix for packages yes the PR from Antoine didn't change that so once I merged um, actually I first merged the change to dev and all the packages were still beta 3 I'm like ah we missed some, some, something and then this was the version suffix that was used to generate the packages so I changed it to RC1 and then we got RC1 so we generated some packages that have a version number which is lower uh, than every other package but that's okay it's on my get then push to master to ship on yuga.org it went well I forgot the tag which I did this morning to create the release and then everyone else creating new PRs and already some things on the dev branch to fix documentation uh, and I will merge all the things that I said are too risky uh, in dev very soon if we find a big thing to fix on master I will fix it on master directly that's not an issue uh, questions Demos. Demos. Let's start with my kill. If I click on the correct thing. Because my kill has done something like two years ago that you will be able to show us today. Uh, hello. Hello. And my kill. I have a PR. I CC'd you on the PR a month ago for you to review because I want to do something with your authentication and I want you to agree with what I did. <laughs> okay. Do you remember last so last last month before my kid goes to vacation, I had uh, a Skype with him because I wanted to be able to do a dynamic auth federated authentication using a tenant. So the tenant is the only authentication endpoint and all the other tenants will just go through this one so we can share the same authentication with this tenant and every time and to do that you had lots of screens to accept 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 so I did a change so you don't have to accept anymore it's just yes this is what I will demonstrate uh, today also um, that might be related mm -hmm. we'll see uh, you can share when you want where is I can't find if you see my screen I'm pointing to it ah okay Do you see my screen? Not yet. Soon. I can see your screen and I assume everyone else too. Okay. Uh, what I have uh, done is uh, I have set up a default uh, tenant uh, with OpenID Connect server and I have set up another tenant that will be the client. Uh, okay, in the authorization server I have uh, enabled the authorization code flow and I have created an application that uses this uh, flow. Also, I have set up the, an external provider 
uh, a Facebook uh, uh, provider in order to do the external authentication uh, demo. Uh, what uh, we have, I have done is in the login, uh, we have a setting to use the external provider for uh, login. So uh, if uh, there is only one external provider defined and uh, then uh, the login screen uh, will uh, automatically challenge the ex that external provider. So that's new? Yes. Also in the registration, uh, there are uh, three types of uh, registration. Uh, allow only external users, so there will be no uh, link to register yourself and provide username, etc., etc., which takes into account these settings. If we have uh, generated a username for external users, then in the registration screen, uh, you will not be asked for a username. Uh, if you use email address from external provider, then it will match the, it will use that email address that is provided from the external provider. And also do not create a local password for external users, so the local user will not be able to log in. That's what I did. <laughs> yes. But in a hacky way, I'm sure you did correctly, I did it in a hacky way. I just skipped the screen. <laughs> and did stuff automatically. Oh my God. Okay, o also I have uh, provided a script to uh, to create a username based on the claims that you receive from the external provider or uh, on the external provider name. So you can create a user that starts with a Azad if it is from Azure Active Directory, for example, as you can see. It will be used uh, when uh, uh, in the generate username for external users function. So it's a JavaScript. Uh, it's, uh, I see. I was thinking. Liquid manager. Yeah, liquid. No, JavaScript maybe more permissive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, in, on the tenant, uh, this this tenant I have uh, set up to use. Uh, uh, the only external provider for uh, login. Uh, uh, so if I log in with, uh, uh, there are no users defined, neither here. Uh, security users. The only user that is uh, set up is uh, the admin. Uh, so, so in tenant one. Okay, let's try to perform a login. I have use the admin so it will uh, show me the tenant one uh, uh, login screen and uh, select if I want to login with the tenant one uh, with a, a host username, a local username or the Facebook that is defined in the host. So in the how, by what magic, how did Facebook appear in the tenant one? Uh, this is the login screen from the uh, OpenID Connect server. No, no, I mean, are you on the, so the left screen is the host tenant, the default tenant. Yes. And the right and screen the, is also the, the okay. uh, sorry, I didn't see that. I thought it was, okay. I thought it was a client tenant. It's the same tenant. Okay. Uh, no, it, it's a, a so, client tenant. Tenant one, T1, but okay, go to admin. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's, it's fine. Okay, so there was a redirect to the tenant one. Yes. Screen. Okay, I didn't, I mean, yes. that. okay, thank you. The, the tenant one is not uh, set up to automatically use the external, pro ah, it, is, it is set up to use automatically the external provider. It's okay. That's I, why I, I, we, we redirect it to the host. Okay, to the. Okay. Yeah, I missed that. Okay. Now, if uh, I will try to log in with Facebook, but uh, he has not, he ha uh, the user will not have access to admin panel, so it will uh, take me back to. Ah, no. I have created a user here. Sorry. Let me log in.
Okay, this is going to end. I have logged in with the uh, uh, admin credentials that uh, validates it on the default host and uh, because it matched the admin uh, uh, account in the tenant one, it uh, requested uh, to enter the local password in order to, to perform the, the, the link. Okay. Uh, I had tested it previously, the Facebook, that's why it asked to log in. Let me delete all the local users and uh, also delete the the link to the to the Open ID Connect server. A little tricky now because it has the same users and if you have, uh, I have, uh, let me show you the settings that we have set up in tenant one and uh, see why this is happened, this happened. Uh, we, we don't, uh, ask uh, the user to provide registration uh, 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 data. We provide them automatically. So when we logged in with uh, the admin credentials on the default host, it matched the local admin and uh, matched the users. Now there are no users, neither in the, oh, here we have it. There is no user in the default host, and there is no Facebook user in the tenant. Okay, so let's try to do it correct. Oh, I have set up, okay. The admin user from the default host is logged in here. Okay, now it redirects me to the login screen of the OpenID Connect server, and I ask Facebook. It logged in to Facebook because I had login from this uh, specific browser and uh, created the user here in the, on the left screen, which is the host, and created a user also on the tenant. Yeah, that's better than my PR, because in my PR I still had some things to click, but here it's magic. Yes, it, it is, uh, and it is uh, uh, configurable. Yeah, yeah, I like uh, it. I can change this uh, behavior, because, okay, in a demo like this, uh, when you have made the login, uh, it does it automatically. I should uh, have logged out from Facebook in order to, to see the whole... Uh, okay, that's beautiful. So I have a question. Yes. Because I, I created a, another branch. After my PR, I wanted to go further. Um, I used Google. And when I go to Google Authentication from my client tenant, um, I wanted um, the Google Authentication to restrict the domain from G Suite to the domain of my client tenant. Because I have multiple customers. They all have different domains on G Suite and I wanted uh, so I could just not filter on Google the domain and it will still work I would be able to authenticate with any Google account fine but if I wanted to limit specific domains for specific clients it's a parameter in the Google auth that is called the HD parameter I think host domain something like that mm -hmm. and I didn't find a way to configure it from the client tenant to the Google Auth. And I was thinking that it should maybe be done in the application entry on the host tenant. So you, here, when you created an application, right, to, to call tenant one on your host tenant. 
is it correct? So I was thinking yes. maybe we should extend that to add custom properties. Maybe they would be specific to each provider, but to send for each application to the to the OAuth domain. Yes. You uh, see what I mean? Because when we go to the Google OAuth endpoint, there is a return URL, but you can also pass the parameter which is, oh, but just for this domain, and then the UI will be limiting the user to a specific domain. But this is specific to each prior, like Google supports that, but not GitHub, for instance. So, and for Google... So it's provider uh, should, uh, have, yes, in the provider settings, it would be... In the provider the settings, computer. probably, and, uh, but it's, and, and, but it depends on each tenant final tenant because tenant one might be foo.com and tenant do two might be bar.com. Yes. So I, I will show you later, but that's something I think we we should have also in the end, at least for Google and maybe some others uh, provide. It's like any OS that supports multi-tenancy. That's the idea. I assume mm -hmm. Azure, Azure will have the same thing because you could authenticate using different tenants and you might want to restrict what tenant you want the user to authenticate with. Like for instance, I have a Microsoft.com account and I have a, maybe a school account. But when I log on tenant one, maybe you don't want to authorize the school account, just Microsoft.com. Yes. That's the idea. Okay. We, uh, but well, I, I I'm, just, I'm just pushing you for the next step, but what I see is already great because I had the, the, the the requirement for that, and I had to create a PR. It was not easy. And your solution is much more extensible, much more parameterable. Parameterizable. Yes. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Other questions for Mike? And before this PR, the experience would have been that after the Facebook click, you would have been redirected to the host tenant saying, oh, do you want to create the user with that and type a password, okay? And then you would have been redirected to the tenant's form and then, oh, please create a user and a, and a password for that. And then consent, and then you will be on the tenant's homepage. Here, there was no hop at all. So just directly to the homepage, all the things created on every tenant, because we need mm -hmm. to create a user account, which we call actually Locally. yeah, for each of the tenants to be able to to represent the user for each tenant. Um, the external lo and then the external login. So we need an entry in the database, and that's what we call a user here. So that's very nice. Love it. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. So we share my screen. And, um, and, 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 should I show something? No, I don't want to show anything. I might show it later. I want to close the meeting earlier. I have a, I have a meeting right after that. Um, I will take questions and topics. What do we have? So just, I assume next week we'll show the full text aspect. Um, that Jasmine did. The idea is that, I think we already mentioned that at the demo, now you can say that, so there is a new field in the Lucene indices that is called full text, and you can configure what's inside. By default, there will be the display text and the body, whatever the body is coming from, markdown, HTML, text, whatever. So when you do full text searches on your content items, this is a field you should look into because it will contain by default the stuff that people will look for in a content item. But you can customize it with Liquid and say, oh, I want to include this field, and I don't want the display text, and I want to include the static text, and so on. Uh, super useful then for search forms. Very flexible. Security critical well, permissions, we already talked about that. Startup class, um, startup class, startup class, I will just show you because it's already on my box here. Oh, oh. oh crap, I won't try again, or I will lock my machine. I don't remember my password. So the idea with this thing is that 
I wish you this was good. <laughs> I might break everything. I need my machine. Um, code starter.cs. I will take this one. So today, if you do a startup a module, you need to inherit from startup base, and you need to have like a configure service that accepts that and a configure method that has the three arguments application builder, service provider, and uh, endpoint routing. So it's mandatory from this base class. So now with this change that we merged, you can do public class startup. You don't have to inherit from nothing. It's like like in ASP.NET Core. Um, and you can do a configure service if you want. You don't have to override anything. And you can go to configure that takes anything, and it will be injected automatically. So it's much more um, simple and, and standard compared to ASP.NET. So that's the change we did. Um, and that's it. And but to test that, I changed the mini profiler module, and I had issues, which actually were because the mini profiler module was not working anymore. So it confused me for some time, like, did I break the startup or it's not working? But now it's fine, everything's working. Um, and that's it. Questions, comments? We'll make a um, blog post on the ASP.NET website, I assume, to announce the new RC. Um, so I have the um, talk on the NetConf uh, in four hours at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and what else? Uh, next release is 1.0 in a month or so, something like that, just for some time to find bugs that with the RC and include the PRs that were too risky for RC that we can include now and fix if they fail, as long as they're not breaking, non-breaking, or we have a solid migration path from RC. Um, what else? Try the localization feature. It's awesome. The fact that all the admin is automatically translated by default, you don't need to add any other package. All the translations are here. Um, then, I think that's it. We'll have to work on documentation. So if you want to write some guides, uh, like um, Jean-Philippe said, he will write a guide on um, um, multilingual um, site to have an example on how to build the site with two cultures with, in terms of content. That's one nice one to have at least and 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 maybe I will find some time to work on the workshop to teach all the things to build websites. That should be also a good um, moment to do that. And I think that's all I have to say. As long as we merge the more PRs than than we have waiting for too long. Questions. Okay, all good. Thanks, everyone. See you on Thursday. Bye-bye.